now invite our chief guest, Dr. Mukisa Kitui, Secretary General, United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, Geneva, for the keynote address. Sir. Excellencies, Honorable Ministers from the Philippines and the Czech Republic, my colleagues from the International Public Service, distinguished guests and participants, may I, on the outset, express my appreciation and thanks to the World Trade Center Mumbai and the All India Association of Industries for not only convening this impressive meeting, but honoring us with the participation to share in your very important and historical work going on today. I want to express my appreciation that you found it worthwhile that the theme of the Global Economic Summit for this year emphasizes the empowerment of women because there's nothing that could be more topical than this, not only for the country of India and other developing countries, but for the entire international community which has committed to an ambitious program of inclusive prosperity by 2030. In my brief remarks, considering that there has been very substantial uh, statements already made, and that key things that I would have liked to say have been eloquently said in a way that I can't even do better. I want to just start by saying, we have to comprehend the kind of environment we are operating in, what are the challenges before us, before we can prescribe solutions to the challenges we face. Globally, there are three trends that are important in considering women empowerment through trade, innovation, and capacity building. The first one is what, in almost the 10th year of a global slowdown in trade, where for the first time since the Second World War, global GDP has been growing faster than global trade. Secondly, we are living, living at a moment in history when some key proponents of international engagement for the past 50 years in the industrialized north have become the critical skeptics about international solidarity. At a time when globalization is being accused for responsibility for all manner of problems, a time when international solidarity is confronted by a growing protectionism and nativist thinking in advanced economies. And three, we are living at a time when global investment has not only been in decline globally, but that the character of foreign direct investment has mostly been mergers and acquisitions, which do not create the jobs we need as much as greenfield investments do. But in the context of this, there are some bright lights as well. One, while global FDI flows have declined dramatically over the past year, and my organization publishes the World Investment Report, so we are the premier institution in the world measuring the flows of investment. In our work of 2016 international trends, which will be comprehensively launched at the UN in New York on the 6th of June this year. We are already noticing substantial differences in the, in, in the trends. While most of emerging Asia had more than 20% decline in foreign direct investment uh, arrivals, India was relatively the best performer in the region, with only a decline of 5% in the FDI flows from 2015 to 2016. At 42 billion US dollars FDI arrivals last year, India remained among the top 10 international destinations of foreign direct investment. But also importantly that for the third year running, greenfield investments are growing faster than mergers and acquisition in India. Meaning, made in India is actually creating new value and creating new jobs. But what that means also is that there's no excuse for India to lag behind in creative opportunities for women. 
That now brings me to my main area of interest. I, like somebody said, we, it is too late in the day for us to try to justify embarrassed women. It's too late in the day for us to try to explain why it's good for society. We just have to say, how do we do it? And say, how do we do it? Entails one major challenge. If you cannot diagnose the, the challenge that you have, you cannot soundly prescribe a solution. Sometimes we pretend that just throwing something at development, that once everybody is developing, then women are developing. It's a false assumption. Many times, negative consequences of development erode the ability and the capacity of women. Before my jo current job as an Secretary General of the United Nations, I had the privilege to serve for six years as a Minister of Trade and Industry of my country, Kenya. And I saw a number of things. One, that you can have women ministers, but you use it as political tokenism to satisfy yourself that women are also represented. And when you want to see whether it's political tokenism, women are made ministers of youth and gender affairs. Two, that the persons who are made ministers from among women are the persons who give the narrative that would rather be said by the men. They do the bidding for the male politicians. And three, that there are no clear measurable goals of government commitment that translates into achievable results for women. If you don't know what is the issue of fighting, you don't know what weapon to use. As a Saudi minister told me recently at a meeting in Shanghai, if you are not aiming at any particular target, you can't miss. Well, whichever way you shoot, you have shot, because you are not aiming to shoot anything in particular. Or as I've always said, those who have no destination cannot get lost. If you don't have any particular targets to achieve, measurable and accessible, you can always pretend that you have succeeded by the rhetoric you use in lieu of progress. So we must start having targets. And when we celebrate success stories, we should use it to empower our own thing about what is possible, what's achievable. How do we transcend tokenism? <coughs> Two weeks ago, I had a meeting in the Bahamas with the Minister of Finance. The minister hosted me and brought in the Permanent Secretary of Finance, the Deputy Minister of Finance, the Controller of Budget, the expert on trade financing, and the leading authority on foreign debt in the government. All of them were women. If you follow me on Twitter, you check my Twitter account, you'll see me standing there with these six phenomenal women. <laughs> there was only one man who came into the room during our meeting. He came to ask us whether we'll have tea or coffee. <laughs> it is possible to go beyond tokenism. It is possible to celebrate what has been achieved, but also to say, what is stalling us in greater success? I say this because I come from a country where not only have we achieved parity in post-primary admission to secondary schools, but Kenya is one of the first African countries where both primary school leaving exams and pre-university exams, girls perform better than boys. The top students are in you know, the public domain. The top students in the post-primary entrance exams and in pre-university exams are girls. And there's 50% parity in admission into university. And that's where the problem starts. How can we have the best students from primary school, from secondary school as girls, and we have less than 15% of the students in graduate classes, in master's classes as girls? A society which celebrates its achievement in getting the 50% must address the inadequacies that are holding back this 50% from translating into higher numbers in later years. It's not because they're less intelligent. I just mentioned back to Bahamas where I've been that the number of students attending graduate classes in the Bahamas is 70% girls.
30% volts. So it means those who are not able to keep through these numbers have a structural issue they must address. I think identifying what holds back the potential of sound policy for strengthening women, and here now slowly turn to matters of trade, is critical in prescribing what is best to be done as a remedy to those challenges. We at the United Nations believe that the best opportunities for realizing the Agenda 2030 goal of inclusive prosperity can only be realized by primarily focusing on women. If we are saying we want to banish extreme poverty, the largest category of the extreme poor are women. And that means the largest effort in dealing with this challenge must target specifically women. Similarly, we must start disciplining our interventions on the basis of understanding what is it that we are trying to cure. I'll give you some specific examples that I've come across. Well, we see the potential of trade to liberate women. It's also true that the ambiguities about using trade to liberate women, if it's not followed by understanding implications of certain policy changes. I'll give you some examples. In many African countries, there are, there's a difference between women crops and men crops. Many times, women are responsible for crops that feed the family. And the men are responsible for cash crops. And state development of agriculture gives credit lines, facilitates trade, and gives fertilizer for cash crops. When the man starts having profit from state subsidies, he reduces the size of family land that is dedicated to food crops to expand the size of the male crops at the expense of the woman crops. What it means is government efforts to strengthen agriculture undermines women as a way of rewarding men. Now, unless you have understanding that policies that strengthen the so-called cash crops must also be applied to strengthen the food security crops, which are predominantly in the woman's sphere, you undermine a woman through policies that are supposed to be developmental. Similarly, in many societies where title belongs to men and women have no financial inclusion instruments, like bank accounts, they do not have title deeds to the land. Many times the woman is the main farmer, but the proceeds of agriculture are deposited on the account of the husband. In my own country, Kenya, there was a miracle which happened 10 years ago when we invented M-Pesa, mobile finance, mobile money. It has now hit India and it's growing very rapidly. The most integrated mobile money in the world is in Kenya. And what was the first thing that happened? that a woman delivers milk to the creamery or she delivers her produce, her tea leaves to the local co tea collection center, at the end of the month, the payment is sent to her mobile phone. It doesn't go to her husband's telephone account, uh, bank account. And the most dramatic evidence that you see that this works is once the money starts arriving on the account of the woman, the food for the family improves, the clothing of the children improves, the man shares between domestic responsibility and improving the consumption in the local pub. He drinks more, but the woman dresses the children more. So this phenomenon that they are saying about empower a woman and you empower a community is very practically realized on very, very easy things like this. We have possibilities of identifying how to balance between liberalizing rules and strengthening women. I've seen a case that applies even to India. India has been a major leader in the developing world and in the emerging world in world trade negotiations. Uh, when I was minister, I had a colleague from India who was a major driver of negotiation called Minister Nath. How would we protect the interests of the vulnerable, of the poor, and so on? But eventually we negotiate in Geneva under the auspices of WTO to liberalize rules for trade, make it easier for trade. Now, trade liberalization has two components. One is that it makes consumer goods more easily accessible and at lower cost. But two, 
It leads many times to the collapse of prices of commodities. Now, a woman as a consumer may be happy that now she's buying chapati at a lower price. But a woman as a producer is unhappy because now her market is flooded by imported products or her commodity vulnerability does not improve because of trade liberalization. Those of us who negotiate trade rules must understand also clearly the balance between the consumer and the producer should not so much be driven but often the urban consumer at the peril of the vulnerable rural producer who is predominantly the weakest link in the chain, the woman. Similarly, when we're dealing with issues of ICT-related enterprise, which I now want to come to, we understand a phenomenon which was mentioned earlier here, that many times, Women entry into global value chains is as a weak link, meaning you enter because they are looking for a low cost mass producer. Mm -hmm. So you find what are the sectors where women are entering in the modern economy? They are entering agribusiness, they are entering textile man, uh, production enterprises, and the entry labor-intensive ICT back office services. The first thing that happens is, relative to other similar enterprises, the remuneration of women's skills in those pools are kept down. I dump it. That you keep down the cost of labor in the areas where women are concentrated as a way of having higher margins of profit. The second thing that happens is this limited growth in skill investment in the women concentrated enterprises. The practices where you have women in packaging enterprises, where you have women as back office operators in the call centers, where you have women in the sweatshops or related enterprises teaching apparel for export to America and Europe. You have very limited structured programs of improving their quality of skills, growing their talents. You have even less incentives for seeing them rise through the ranks of the enterprise. They enter working at their table and they retire at that table. There is no architecture, there is no roadmap of moving from a floor level worker to part of management. At a time when we're looking for inclusive prosperity, we must identify this as challenges, not just about better remuneration, but about life skills and promotion of the entrepreneurs, of the individuals that are involved. Stagnation over many years is part of the frustration and the negatives of keeping women subordinate to men. An urgent priority area, to my mind, belongs to both women and men. For men, it's a responsibility and an awareness that more than 50% of our investment in national realization has to go in the direction of women. And for women, is to remember what I heard a woman primary school teacher say once in Kenya, that nobody can make you inferior Nobody can make you feel inferior without your permission. The sense that you are inferior is only possible when you accept the ideology of the other that they are superior to you. So a collective empowerment that you can reach for the skies, that you are capable just like anybody else, is critically important in realizing that you can always rise from the challenges you face. Many of you are only one or two generations away from a society when women had to be very regulated in going into public life. And some still have it. Today we are saying about the miracles of ICT-driven opportunities in enterprise. But in societies where you get ICT access through an internet cafe, and where women are not allowed freely to go out from the homestead, it means all men start with a major advantage. They're the only ones who use the, 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 the art cafes. And the women have secondary access. Indeed, our global projection 
is that there are as many as 200 million more women who are not accessing the internet as there are men in South Asia alone. And so looking at targeted methods of inclusion become part of the collective challenge of exploring what opportunities exist in e-commerce and other electronic related enterprises. And this is uh, the area I want to focus in on um, my, 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 my final remarks. We believe that demonstrations of computer related enterprise growth over the past few years, the past two decades, has shown how ICT related services have a greater absorption of labor than traditional manufacturing. And it is our sense that not only must we grow e-commerce, but we must have targeted policies for e-commerce to serve vulnerable groups. E-commerce targeted to support specific concerns for women can include higher attention to growing women e-commerce entrepreneurs, higher determination of forcing major companies in outsourcing to target women-specific enterprises as suppliers. We at Antad have done it. We started off in uh, Nepal, and we have replicated in Tanzania to scale up. That many times, women who produce a quality product may be growing vegetables, but they don't feel confident enough, enough to walk to a next-door five-star hotel and say, look, instead of the vegetables you are importing from another country, why don't you give me the contract to supply those vegetables? And if you go to the hotel, they'll say, but these ones are producing dirty vegetables and they cannot satisfy the quantities we need. Now, working with government ministries and other UN agencies, we go and get women producers to make a promise, a commitment to supply. We get the consumer to commit to purchase whatever is supplied. And then we get government agencies to facilitate quantity and quality control for the supply. And it sticks. It's not rocket science. It's a possibility that we can work through. And similarly, the outsourcing work which women are doing at the behest of enterprises owned by men should increasingly go to being owned by women themselves. I want to round off by expressing again our appreciation that e-commerce offers opportunities, but it's not alone. We at Amtad have noticed a critical importance, for example, of attention to the creative industries. Creative industries, musical traditions of India, Bollywood, the whole land of Bollywood does not need to be told twice what potential exists in the creative industries. And the thing is that they have phenomenal opportunities for tapping into the genius and talented skills that exist in womankind that is inadequately embraced and appreciated by patriarchal society. And we want to work with you on this. We want to walk down the path where we all realize that investing in women is not a favor, it's an imperative. And that national rational thinking forces the most hardcore of male chauvinists to see that self-interest drives them towards attention to the forgotten half of humanity. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Kitui, for those thought-provoking words. Mm -hmm.